All right, welcome to episode five of WCBN Sports' presentation of Socially Distant Sports Talk. Uh, on today's episode, joining us from The Athletic is Max Boltman. How are you doing today? Hey, Alex, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. Um, so, uh, like all the interviews, we're going to just sort of first look at your career in sports media, and then we'll talk a little sports at the end of the interview. But uh, this is a question I ask everybody, first and foremost, is uh, at what age did you know you wanted to go into sports media? Uh, probably 18 or 19. So I, I did not uh, know, like, going into college that it was something I wanted to do. I, I went to Michigan uh, and started at the Daily early on in my freshman year. And even then, that was not really a career-focused decision. That was just kind of seemed like a fun thing to do, seemed like a fun way to, you know, make friends and, and be around the sports community at Michigan. And uh, it just kind of stuck. And so I think it was probably, I was probably 19. So it was probably after, during or after my sophomore year, I had covered the men's basketball team and went to do an internship at uh, Sporting News in Charlotte. And somewhere in there, I think I kind of decided that it, it, it was, it was fun and it, I felt like I was okay at it. And I put some, I guess I put my full uh, energy to it at that point. So picking up something you mentioned there, this is a little different than some of the other people we've interviewed, but you're a Michigan guy, a recent Michigan grad. Um, how did attending University of Michigan sort of prepare you for a career in sports media? Yeah, well, it's interesting because they don't have a, a journalism school at Michigan, as obviously you know. Yep. So um, a lot of it was through student publications and yeah. um, I mean, almost all of it, right? Like the daily I thought was an awesome experience because it was such, such a fun time that it, it was really easy to want to spend hours and hours there. And, you know, you know how it is like, that's really what it takes to get okay at something is you got to be willing to put hours and hours into it. So yeah, I met most of my best friends at the daily, my girlfriend at the daily, there was just a lot of reasons I wanted to be there. And then as a result, you just end up spending so much time on your writing and, and around people who are really creative and really thoughtful about how they want to do things. We had great alumni, great speakers always coming in. Um, and then it helped to be in like a major college sports media market just organically where, you know, every single event you covered, you could see like what questions someone like Mark Snyder, Brendan Quinn, Nick Baumgartner, all these guys who I think are just Titan beat writers. Uh, Mark isn't in the business anymore, but you know, he was just a, an outstanding mentor for me in my sophomore year. He let me kind of be his, his assistant in the, in the press box for football games. And I would have kind of pregame stories that I would have to report. And um, so, and, and Mark, you know, that's separate. That's the free press, but Mark's a daily alum too. So he would, he would have daily kids do stuff like that for him. So it opened a lot of doors for me for sure. And, and just kind of being in that environment, getting those reps, I think was basically everything. Uh, you mentioned obviously no journalism school at, at Michigan. What was your major then? I was in the Ford school of public policy. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, another, another thing related to that, obviously you mentioned football and basketball. What was your first beat at the daily? Where, where did you start out? Yeah. My first beat was softball. So, oh, yeah. yep with Hutch and uh, she's awesome. Just one of the best, number one, outstanding coach, right? But also just one of the best people you could possibly cover early in your career. Yeah, that's a fun interview. It is, and, and, and she holds you to a high standard. Like if you ask a dumb question, yeah, you know, she, you're gying to kind of understand that you've asked a dumb question. And so it forces you to really prepare for an interview to know like what is, what is just kind of rote and obvious and, and what is something that you know, what do I actually want to know the answer to? And, and that I think is kind of becomes a guiding principle is like, don't ask a question that you don't actually want to know the answer to, or that you, you know, where you're just fishing for a quote to something you think you already know. Cause if you are, then you're going to get an obvious answer. That's probably not going to be useful. Was that, um, what year was that? Were you in the Romero years then? Yep. Sierra Romero, um, yeah. outstanding player, Sierra Lawrence. So this would have been spring 2014. Yeah. So, yep, it was Sarah Driesinga, Megan Betts, Haley Wagner, Sierra Romero, Sierra Lawrence, Lindsay Montemorano, Kelly Christner, might have been one year later. But, yeah, a lot of really good players. Yeah. Uh, so after uh, graduating, then you went on and now work at The Athletic. Um, I'm kind of interested in, in hearing the backstory behind that because that's obviously a newer company, a newer publication. Uh, how did you wind up there? Yeah, um, it's a great question. 
kind of being in the right place at the right time a little bit. Um, I was an intern at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette after college, so that would have been summer 2017. The Athletic launched in June 2017, and uh, I they were still looking for kind of building out their staff. And, I, you know, Craig and I had corresponded a little bit about me potentially freelancing. And so when I left the Post-Gazette, um, Craig Custance is my boss. I don't know if you know him. Yeah. Um, I went home to Grand Rapids, and I was basically – driving to and from Ann Arbor as often as I possibly could trying to find good stories and uh, freelance for the athletic. And so after two, three months of that, um, Craig called me and said they had a position open up for a general assignment reporter. So I was going to kind of be a utility guy, everybody's backup, finish out on Michigan and then just kind of be, you know, picking up stories wherever I could. And I did that. That led to covering the Tigers for most of the 2018 season. And then uh, I, I went to help Craig at the draft. In So I'm already full staff by this point. November 2017, I think, is when I started. But then I, when I got onto the Red Wings, um, was basically the 2018 draft. I went to help Craig out on that. And I think it went pretty well. And so then by the time the 2018-19 season started, um, they had basically said I could be on the Red Wings beat. So. Um, I'm having a great time with it though. A lot of, a lot of it is definitely being in the right place at the right time. And um, I don't know if the company, if I was graduating today and the company was where it was, I'm not sure that I would be been able to get that opportunity to do that. And so incredibly grateful uh, that, that things worked out that way because it's, it's, it's been really fun. Did you want to end up on the Red Wings beat or was that just sort of the, the opportunity and, and you snagged it? It's interesting. So when I graduated college, um, I think I would have probably told you I would want to cover football. And I don't know if it was just because that was the beat I had been on for my junior and senior years at Michigan. But um, what happened was it was like the trade deadline in the 2017-18 season. And Craig was, you know, he's, he's an insider. So he, he was working some trade deadline stories. And I was just kind of around the rink, um, you know, covering the, the Red Wings for that period. And I had I'd played hockey in high school, but I had kind of, you know, not been around it too much through college, covered a few series here and there at Michigan. Um, and I just remembered how much I liked hockey and how much, you know, I, I missed being around the rink. And, um, and I felt like I understood it more than maybe even after covering football for a couple of years, I still, you know, I never played football. I never fully understood like blocking schemes and kind of finer details of why things happened. I just knew what I was seeing happen. Hockey, I felt like I could see a little bit more of the, well, this happened because of this. And um, so I, after a while, you know, a couple of weeks of that, I, I was like, man, that was pretty fun to cover hockey. And then the draft was obviously great. And um, so long way of saying, no, it was not like a lifelong dream of mine to cover the Red Wings. Now that I'm on it, uh, it does feel a little bit like a, like a dream beat because I'm having so much fun with it. And I, I remember how much I, you know, had liked hockey basically until I got to college and, and just wasn't around it that much um, just because that wasn't my beat. So um, yeah, anyway, that's a long way of saying no, but, but I really love covering the Ravens. I'm impressed you still wanted to do football after a couple of years of covering Michigan football. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, sort of moving on in, in this train of thought, I want to just first ask um, with regards to working at the athletic uh, how many sort of games do you travel to on the road in a given year? Because obviously you think about newspaper beat writers, they're at like almost every game. I'm not really sure. How how much do you travel um, in your capacity? I'm trying to think exactly how much. I think I was probably at – of the road games that actually happened, like I was booked to go on a couple more toward the end of the year that obviously had to cancel – um, I think I was probably somewhere 12 to 15 road games and then every home game. So I think it's close to 75% of the total games. And, I, you know, at the athletic, it varies so much writer to writer. For me, there were trips where, you know, you could go on the road to like Ottawa or you can go to Grand Rapids. So I probably still see north of 82 live games a year. It's just, they're not always, sometimes I think it's, you know, especially the state of the Red Wings. Um, it, it's just as useful and, and certainly, you know, closer to go to Grand Rapids and watch some prospect games than it is to uh, to go on the road and, and take a plane somewhere. So I, I, 
I think it's probably 12 to 15 NHL road games, but then there's also a good chunk in there of, of kind of road games that are just like the Griffins games. Uh, that kind of leads to another question I had. You mentioned covering the Tigers and now covering the Red Wings. You haven't had the best success covering winning teams so far uh, in your <laughs> in your career at the Athletic, but what's the dynamic like when you cover a team that, you know, is really struggling uh, like this year's Red Wings were, for example? I mean, how how does that affect your mindset? What is it like in the locker room after games, et cetera? Well, I don't know the difference, like you said. Like, I've only ever covered teams that are toward the very bottom of the standings, um, at least you know, pro teams. When I covered Michigan basketball, they had a tough year. Michigan football, it's a different animal because, you know, nine and three is like this gigantic failure yeah. in, in the eyes of so much of the Michigan fan base. So, um, and just that's just how football works. Every game is so important. So, and there, there was no open locker room. So as for, you know, what it's like, these guys live and die with their job, right? So they're, they're very bummed after a loss. The, the peak example that I use is after the Toronto game this year, the night before Thanksgiving, like the dejection in the locker room was, was pretty stark. Um, but at the same time, you know, the next day, everyone's back at the rink and, you know, in a long losing streak, you can, you can still kind of feel that there's some, it's, it's just tough to go through, but, you know, everyone wants to get better. And these guys are all pro athletes. I, I am a believer that the margin is slim between even in a two, three goal loss, there's things that could have gone the other way. And, you know, a couple plays here and there change the outcome. So everyone's really, they're still locked in and motivated. It's just probably not the, you know, a little bit looser environment that I imagine it's like to cover a team in the middle of like a five game win streak, but I would not know as of now. Did you, uh, did you grow up a Red Wings fan, being from Grand Rapids? When I was a kid, I mean, obviously that was the team that, that would have been on TV and stuff. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't – we didn't have cable once I was, like, 11 or 12. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. have had FSD from probably sixth grade on. Um, so I would watch the Red Wings when they were on, and I remember watching, like, the 08 and 09, um, but more so the 09 Stanley Cup uh, run. Uh, when they lost to the Penguins, but you know that was because it was on national TV, right? Yeah. So I, I watched a lot of whatever the Sunday NBC game was, and uh, yeah. So when I was when I was really young, yes. And then as I got older, it just got tougher to follow, right? Like it was, I was watching whatever the national sports games were. How would you say that uh, COVID-19 has affected sort of your job? Hmm. Um, different ways. I think in the day-to-day -day landscape of things, obviously you're not going to the rink anymore for that month that there was probably left of the season. Um, but by mid-April, I wasn't going to be anyway. Yeah. Um, what it really has changed is some of the other events. Like there was no U18 Worlds in Plymouth. Uh, there was no World Championships to watch and cover uh, remotely like last year. I don't know if you remember Anthony Mantha and Philip Peronik both had really big tournaments there. That was those were stories. Um, the draft getting pushed back. I mean, the draft should be this week. It sounds yeah. crazy. Like, I was going to be in Montreal probably today, uh, and that was a huge thing. So it's pushed a lot of the timeline back and. Um, that's kind of the, 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 the small, ma the micro view of it on the, in the big picture, like it's, it's not a ton different in terms of, um, the kinds of stories I'm really doing. Like I, you know, I did a feature last week on the O one off season when they signed Paul and Robitaille and traded for Hoshik. Those are the kinds of stories that I'd have been doing. Uh, anyway, I don't, I don't think the, the stories or the job has really changed all that much. It's just kind of the schedule. So, it, it, you know, maybe a little bit more phone focused than it would have been a year ago. And obviously, you always have to be thinking about, um, you know, covering things from the lens of, you know, the, the salary cap might change a little bit. And those are kind of different, you know, story angles. But as for the way to, like, approach the job, this summer doesn't feel all that different than past summers other than there's no draft imminent, there's no world championships, and there's no 
you know, live hockey to kind of be covered. So it just feels a little bit uh, delayed or like there's a little, you know, extended off season. But, but in terms of the actual, you know, doing of the job, I don't feel like it's changed too much. Yeah. Uh, another thing that you do at The Athletic is uh, your podcast, Wings for Breakfast. I very much enjoy listening to that. What was the uh, process behind starting that? Was that something you wanted to do or – uh, were you instructed to do that? What, what was the, what was the backstory there? I had wanted to do a podcast for a while. Um, and I thought, you know, Prashanth was a perfect, you know, fit for, for that too. Um, you know, we had, we had a podcast expansion though around that time. And so it made sense as part of that, I thought to, to do a Red Wings one and Prashanth, uh, thankfully was willing to do it. I think he's such a, a smart hockey mind. And I thought, you know, that was a great way to add you know, his, his insights and his knowledge about, you know, hockey and about especially the data and the analytics side of hockey that is becoming so important. Uh, I thought it was a great way to, to add that to kind of what our readers were getting and our listeners were getting. So um, I had wanted to do a podcast in some form, but it helped that we had kind of a company um, you know, movement toward podcasts around that, around that time too. Uh, my next question uh, is actually, uh, obviously kind of interesting in the way that I was able to contact you over Twitter, but what is the role of technology and social media in your job? How do you, how do you feel that sort of affects you, enhances your ability to, to gain access to stories, et cetera, whatever you, whatever you have on that? It's a very good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, my DMs are open, so um, sometimes interesting things will come into my DMs, not you know, terribly often, but <laughs> well, it's always out there if anyone out there wants to send me something interesting. Um, but, I, I'll, you know, I use it to interact with people. I like to know what people think and, and how people, especially, you know, maybe to a fault a little bit about, like, if people think I'm off base about something that I've written, I want to hear it because I think it's good feedback and I think it's good to, to check yourself. Um, it can be a little hard to sometimes weather uh, some of the harsher stuff, but that's just part of it. Um, and then as for, like, doing the job of reporting – most of the athletes I cover are ballpark my age. So I know, you know, they use social media, maybe not quite to the degree I do because I, that's how I promote a lot of my work and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I, I know that they're on Instagram, they're on Twitter. Um, and, and sometimes you will see little ideas for stories in, in things that they're doing or, or, or whatnot. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a useful tool. You, you want to be careful. Like I don't follow a ton of, you know, of Red Wings players on social media just because you know I, I don't it's not necessarily the the role I use it for but uh, every once in a while if, if I see something come through that I, you know that that seems like it could be worth uh, a story then then it's a really good tool for, for finding those things. What would you say your favorite piece that you've written at The Athletic is? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know the answer. There's probably different answers in different kind of buckets like a lot of my favorite stories tend to be feature stories where I think you really get to know people I thought I did one earlier this summer on Madison Bowie's grandma he has a tattoo of her he never got to meet her um, she adopted his dad and she has a fascinating story they, the family has a fascinating story and I thought it was just really cool hearing you know how this woman that Madison never actually got to meet um how she made such a big impact on his life. And ultimately he might not be in the NHL right now if it were not for her and the way that she was his dad. That stands out in my mind, but it's also just one of the most recent ones I did. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's right there. There's also, you know, stuff like I, I love doing the 01 off season and the 89 draft that I did last year. Um, just looking back into how those things came together. I think those are like historical dives can be really fascinating. When I was on Tigers, I did one on, Shane Green that I thought was just a great story of you know, perseverance by Shane to, to make it to the majors and to become uh, at the time like he was, a, he was one of the Tigers best players now he's with the Atlanta Braves so there's all kinds of stuff like that but I tend to gravitate more toward the, the feature style stories and um, ideally you know the, the more personal the more true to someone's heart and, and, and to why they are where they are uh, the better yeah uh, a couple final questions about hockey in the NHL at large this Friday, obviously the draft lottery, the, the one day a year Red Wings fans have been waiting for. Tell us who's going to win the lottery. 
the Buffalo Sabres. I just have a weird, weird gut feeling about it. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's say the Red Wings get the fourth pick. Um, yeah. What do you feel about who would they take? What's your What's your thought at the moment? I mean, none of us really know, but I want yeah. to get your in, opinion here. Well, I think it go a number of different – like that, you, you know, that's kind of the start of a, a longer tier of players where it seems yep. like the first three, unless someone, you know, decides they want to take a defenseman, like whether that's Jamie Drysdale or, or Jake Sanderson uh, at two or three, uh, then you're probably looking at Lafreniere, Quinton Byfield, and Tim Stutzla going one, two, three. At four, it really is – it's going to be a preference thing. It's, if you want a center – probably Marco Rossi, but he's 5'9". If you want uh, kind of a playmaking winger, you could go with Lucas Raymond or Cole Perfetti. If you want the pure goal scorer, you can go with Alex Holtz. If you want a defenseman, you can go with Drysdale or Sanderson. If you want a goalie, you can go with Askarov. I think all of those probably could be defensible picks. If it were me, I think I would probably lean toward Lucas Raymond or Marco Rossi. Raymond, because I think he has the superstar potential uh, in terms of the, the lightning in a bottle, skill, playmaking, dynamic offensive threat that the Red Wings need. But I also think center is such a position of importance that if you can get a guy, even at 5'9", who looks like, and from everything you you hear and read, is going to compete at a level that's going to kind of mitigate that, um, there's a compelling argument for that too. Very few people have ever scored at the OHL level at the rate that Marco Rossi did this year. So um, I – those to me seem like two pretty compelling options, but you know, I I don't think that there's a pick in that range of guys I just mentioned that you couldn't find a reason to say it makes some sense. Yeah, uh, you know, the Red Wings obviously not going to play more games uh, this season. I don't know how closely you've been following the return to play uh, plans of the league, but I interviewed Ken Daniels about three weeks ago, and he at that time said that he felt it was only about 50 50 that there's another game played in this 2020 season. Where do you see if you have an answer in terms of, of how likely it is the NHL actually resumes this, this current season? I don't know. I'd probably defer to Ken on that. I mean, I I think um, there's a lot of incentive to do it right with all the money at stake, but at the end of the day, you'd still have the, the coronavirus out there and, you know, who knows how, how it ultimately works out. The hub cities, hopefully, once you know that, and you know a little bit more about what the actual plans for um, how, you know, what that's going to look like. But I might lean slightly more likely than 50-50, but you know, I, there's still so many variables, right? Like it's so, so many things could happen. You see spikes happening right now, players testing positive. I think that was probably inevitable, um, but you know, especially pre-bubble. But I don't know. I, I don't have a great answer for you there. Yeah. Uh, let's see. One more question. Uh, this is a friend of mine wanted me to ask you this, but uh, do you see Anthony Mantha as a top line player on a rebuilt Red Wings team? Yes, I do. I think he's really good. Uh, I think it, you, there's a number of ways you could look at it. I mean, obviously the durability, he has to stay healthy, but prior to the last couple of years and a couple of not connected injuries that hadn't been a gigantic problem, um, in his NHL career. Um, and you look at the analytics of it, and I know people have varying views on this. Like he's a player who seems to impact the game really strongly at both ends. And it holds up to what I see, that he's a big guy with a great shot, a good hockey brain, and just such a long body. He can be so disruptive at either end. He can start the rush from his own end. He can finish a play on a one-timer. So, yes, I mean, I think there are, there, are, there are some metrics out there that would tell you he is already, you know, there and, and you know, even maybe a little higher than just being a top-line player. If you look at, like, Dom Wish's and, uh, GSVA metric, which is our in-house kind of um, war, if you will, stat, um, he's already in that tier of, of outstanding players. And I think as you see it over a full season, more and more people will – tend to agree with that, you know, on just an eye basis. I, I think he's a really, really, really good player. I'm, I'm definitely inclined to agree. But uh, that's all the questions I have for you. Um, I want to thank you for, for joining us. It's been very interesting, and, and uh, it was great to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was really great and great questions, and uh, thanks for putting it together. Yeah, for sure.
Um, so that does it for uh, this week's episode, and we'll see you next week.